Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Race and Our Political Mo Moment. I'd like to welcome Jermaine to the stage to begin our session. Hi, everybody. Um, so on this panel, we have Brianna Adjumang. Uh, Brianna Adjumang, sorry. There we go. Uh, she is the renowned co-founder of Hashtag The Show Must Be Paused and the Brownie Agency. Um, she's also a senior artist campaign manager at Apple's Artist Services Division, Platoon. Uh, we also have Jessica Lynch, who is a founding partner at Generation Titans, a social impact firm with a race and equity lens. Uh, at Generation Titans, Jessica has worked with organizations like American Eagle, Girls Who Code, Ben and & Jerry's, and Google on community engagement strategies and DEI efforts. Uh, and then we have Ahmed H. Ahmed. Ahmed is the director of partnership and professional learning at Overcoming Racism, where he facilitates race and equity professional development and provides coaching and support for partner organizations while working to expand the scope and impact of the organization. A Boston University alumnus, Ahmed taught middle school mathematics, science, and reading in Atlanta prior to beginning his career in teacher coaching and development. Uh, how are you, everybody? Hey. Good, good, good. Yeah. good. 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 Have you? Thanks for joining us. Um, I know we chatted about it briefly, but um, you know, there's some questions I'm going to throw out to the group, and then there's some that will be pointed to uh, specific people. The first question I'm going to throw out is is for everyone. Um, how would you compare this current moment? of uh, anti-black racism, you know, and all of that to, to historical moments of uprising, I guess. In what ways do you find this current moment, this current political climate and social climate similar to things that we've seen in the past? And in what ways do you find it different? So if I could go, um, I think this moment in terms of similarities to the past, there are certain things that we have seen that our parents have seen, right? Microaggressions, just not being seen in the same way as our white counterparts in certain spaces. I do think there is a, a different way that they're handling it now, right? In terms of, you know, it's not as outright and as forthright, but I also think that in certain instances, depending on where you are, it's very on, much on the forefront. I happen to be in Brooklyn, New York. So we're, I'm in a very diverse city. I work in music. It's it's a very diverse environment. So it's not as out in the open as um, probably our parents have experienced. But I will say that the difference now in terms of people who are trying to make change, it's not just us, right? There are people of all colors trying to make change now, which I think, um, you know, I'm only a certain age, so I, I don't know what was happening in, in the past, but it does seem that everyone is a little, is now noticing that there are problems that we need to address. And it's not just black people noticing that. I'd, I'd add to um, Brianna, I remember in 2015 and shortly after, you know, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, I was working in corporate America and it was only black and Latinx employees talking about what was happening. And everyone was, I remember taking a walk and, and the companies weren't saying anything. And I think uh, right now we can talk about if it's performative and the reasons, but I feel like to Brianna's point, people are talking and it's not just a one day, let's get back to work. And I think that's different than what even five years ago, um, how long and how sustainable and if it's authentic, I think it's a different question, but definitely think you have more people involved um, and it's not just black and brown people. And that actually, I, I was gonna say, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in, but I was gonna say that's part of my next question of does it feel authentic? Do we feel like, do we feel like there's going to be real action steps taken here or do we feel like this is all just a, a quote unquote moment in time? Um, yeah, so like history is, history is an interesting thing because it like tells us a lot, but it doesn't tell us everything. Um, so, I mean, in the work that I do, like I try to ground everything from a historical perspective and, you know, part of history is you got to listen to history, right? So when I think about this time right now, um, it feels different to me than just experiences I'm thinking about, about, you know, social change um, and radical social change over the past 10 years, right? Um, even this notion of like, drop the idea of reform, go to, you know, abolition. Um, and, you know, I thought it was just me. And then uh, I saw an interview that Angela Davis was doing, and I'm going to like paraphrase and not quote, um, but she said, this is a very exciting time. People are asking to reimagine foundational realities in our society. Like, we don't want to change things. We want to like literally blank slate, think about what could possibly be 
paint that picture and then demand that unapologetically. Um, and it's weird because like in her reflection, there was a level of like, we weren't doing that during the civil rights movement, right? Like we were like, police stop killing us, right? And then people are like, nah, that's not good enough. Like don't exist anymore, right? Um, and she, can, she literally used the word exciting for like, it's an exciting time as a result of that um, because there's something powerful about, you know, the dreaming aspect of innovation. Like we think about innovation with technology um, and healthcare, but like we don't really think about innovation when it comes to social change. And, you know, I just think like, you know, it's within my lifetime that the concept of a phone had to be plugged in to like it not being plugged in to like being playing snake on your phone to like being able to FaceTime and then now it's international, like long distance calls aren't a thing anymore, right? It's like just the, the, the pace in which it's changed is crazy through that lens. And when, you know, we apply it to like social change, it just requires people to really, really think outside the box. And, and is it going to do anything? I mean, I'm on the fence about that, right? Fundamentally, um, I will I will say this: there is a more intersectional and cross-sectional force behind the movements now um, than you know at scale than we have really seen historically in the past. Um, so that gives me hope. But again, as time progresses, the thing that you're fighting against is deeply more deeply entrenched uh, than it was previously. Um, and, and I think that we run the risk also of of the reality of performative allyship of co-opting of you know, the soundbite and in this kind of like social reality that we have right now, differentiating between what's real and what's uh, like unintentionally perpetuating an individual image and ego um, is really the problem that we kind of have to spend some time figuring out. And okay, and I, that's very real. And I think and to that end, you know, how do we, in, in this, not only in this moment, but going forward, right? Especially with something that you touched on, like uh, defunding the police or abolishing the police. How do we, outside of allies or whoever, right? How do we as a community that is very much invested in this moving forward, how do we maintain that momentum? How do we, how do we kind of take the onus off of the others and say like, all right, we're gonna move this forward with or without you. What are things that we can be doing? Yeah, you want me to take that? No. I didn't know. That's Sorry, that's to the yeah. group. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the one thing I want to add is like, we really got to differentiate between the, are we, I mean, we have to put in place the role of an ally, right? So like allyship is cool, right? I'm always like starter pack, right? If you want to talk about movement starter pack, you get allyship. And there's this idea of like, yeah, solidarity, I'm here with you. Um, but the, the thing that inhibits allyship from being productive is that there's no risk involved in allyship. We retweet things, we post things, solidarity, we might donate, but we're always at like a safe distance, approximate distance. And our ability to maintain that distance is a manifestation of privileges that we have, right? Like men can maintain distance from the efforts of sexism and the efforts against misogyny, right? Because it's like safe and the direct impact of that system on us is less felt or we're less cognizant of it. So then we can do things from the fringes. Um, and you know, you could do things from the fringes really well, but if you're still at the fringes, like that's when you get allyship. Um, the reality is, is we have to move to this place of like co-conspiratorship, which is really realizing that all of these systems that don't work for people results in a reality where we all lose. And we don't lose at the same extent or to the same in the same ways, um, but there also is a universal net loss. And I think like that shift is really the, the place that we need to go where an individual who's in the dominant group, right? Like as men talking about sexism, um, as white people talking about racism, as able-bodied people talking about ableism, as hetero people talking about um, genderism and sexism and homophobia, right? As people in the out group, we need to make sure that we're always focusing ourselves in identifying how that problem actually affects us, right? Why we have a stake in the movement, right? Like white people will benefit from, the, from getting rid of systemic racism. Right. And that is like the absence of that understanding allows people to stay in this allyship realm. And once you understand that, then you are now a co-conspirator. Now it's not like I'm helping you in your movement. It is we are working together for our movement. Also, to add to that, I think to your point of what how do we keep this going? I feel like it can't just be I think we're seeing the influence that this movement is having. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing police departments start to shift buzz budgets. You're seeing companies start to, you know, really be open and honest about the lack of diversity. Um, but I think that influence has to shift to power. And what does real power look like? That is completely different. And that might mean giving up power, that is giving up a board seat, that is giving up what you know 
of you know what policing looks like right now. And until I think we are really talking about power and not influence, like that's we cannot settle until that point. I think that for me is like, how do we keep this movement going? Let's get to a place where it's not just, oh, we're inviting you to sit at the table. It's like we have power at that table or we have our own tables. Yeah, I would say that I think personally what I've experienced now, especially in my current roles is people are asking, okay, what can we do, right? So part of that is not only having the dialogue, because I feel like what what that question is is the same in some instances for all of the companies, but it's also very, those little minute details are different for each company as well. It's like, yes, we wanna see more, you know, we wanna see more diversity at the C-suite level. We wanna, we wanna be able to see like, how are you actually helping the people within the company who are there now? How are you helping them grow? And how are you allowing them to grow within the company so that they don't have to go elsewhere to grow, right? How are we getting more people inside? So in terms of the movement, it's not only about you know, what What can we do right now, but how can we change it on the long-term and continuing to have those conversations? Yes, it's unfortunate that some of us are the ones who are having to lead that change because we're not always the leaders of these companies. We're not the CEOs. We're not, you know, we're not the C-level execs all the time, right? But if they're gonna listen, we can use that power while we have it right now so that we can continue to have that power in the future because now they know that they need us. It's not just about people who are not tied to the movement making decisions. We're all like, you know, to Ahmed's point, we're all co-conspirators. Now they also are like, okay, we feel that we also need to make this change, not just for the people in our company, right? But for ourselves, right? We all feel tied to this movement. So yeah, that's what I would, yeah. And then I'll just like one other, just last thing I'll say on this piece. I think we can't talk about racism without talking about capitalism and yeah. knowing like purchasing power, knowing why our company's responding because they're looking and saying, oh, we are afraid, right? There's a fear around consumerism and people saying we're going to boycott. And I think just knowing that piece and being able to, you know, continue, continue that piece um, over the long term. Mm -hmm. And imperialism and colonialism, right? Like those, which again goes to like foundationally the, the, the truths that this country is predicated on. Yeah, literally our whole, our whole being as a country and also maybe as a world, by the way, is based on racism and inequality, period. Yeah, and I think I, I, that's entirely, that's very real. Um, and I think, Bri, I, I wanna kind of dig in a little deeper on just kind of in your your specific um, industry and in music, just because you know you did, you did start the hashtag, the show must be paused, you co-founded that. And I think what we're seeing quite frankly is a lot of a lot of these big corporations and media companies kind of kind of step up and, and do these performative gestures but there's still a history beneath that that is not in line with what they're doing so i i would be curious from from your end from being inside the music business like what have you seen in a, in a business that continually does profit off of black people in particular what have you seen in terms of the systemic racism in that industry and in that business? And, and you know, what I, I'm just more curious to kind of unpack what you've seen there, which actually probably prompted you to really step up and say, you know what, we're taking, we're taking a day off from making everybody rich. So I think there's so many things we see on a daily basis, right? Even the divisions of urban departments from pop and rock departments, right? And what that actually looks like when you're in buildings. And also just, I think before streaming, right, when 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 people were mainly do, buying music via, you know, physical CDs and that, what you saw was there was pop music and what that looked like. We all know what that looks like, right? And then streaming came along and then you saw what the actual popular music became, right? It's not because there was a shift and I don't I don't think it was because there was a shift in what people liked. I think there was this this music was always popular, but now that you don't have to buy CDs, right? And and you know, the CDs were thirteen dollars, fifteen dollars, and you know, in some communities there were bootlegging things happening. You know, bootlegging was happening, right? And where what the what the bootleggers were actually bootlegging in terms of types of music. So now that you're seeing 
streaming in terms of accessibility, in terms of music for all people, you're seeing the popular music is hip hop. You're seeing the popular music is R&B. It's, it's black music, right? So now I don't think the shift has been, is changing in terms of what types of music people are liking. I think just, it's just showing now how people consume music just shows what is actually the more popular music in our country, right? So now we see that shift into black music, right? But then also, I think there is not a value put on the black music the way their value is put on other types of music. When you look at black music in its totality, because in the end, black music is everything, right? When you look at the history of music, it's rock, it's it's a country, it's all of these things. But in our labels, we're talking about urban. It doesn't include country and rock. That's separate, right? Because that doesn't look like us anymore. Now we're only talking about hip hop. And even now we're incorporating Afrobeat into that as things are changing. And even how we're valuing Afrobeat in the largest grand scheme of things and how people, there's not even a genre for it when you look at it on, um, you know, on the platforms, you literally have to put it under world music. You know, there's, there's a difference in value that is being placed on the different types of music. And that goes into how we are treated in the building. It's not saying on a day to day we're treated like horribly, but when, in terms of pay scale, in terms of diversity at the top, in terms of all of these things, it's not represented in the same way in terms as as the the music that is generating money in the world right now. So, you know, we see that on a daily. And while our jobs, in the end, we're not saving the world, right? But our jobs are providing something to the world. We're providing happiness in a way, and we're providing a message that you know, that's very powerful. Music has always been a form of change throughout history. So why can't we use this and on the business end to change how we are respected in the industry? So, yeah. yeah. And and I kind of want to take that. That's such a great, that's such a great point of view. And I want to open that up kind of to everybody because I think music is, music is one of the easiest examples of where we can build our own right where where you can see somebody like chance who can say i'm independent and i'm i'm building my own platform and doing all these things i'm very curious for the group you know do we feel like this moment is going to lead to more of that in every industry that idea of building your own and not and not waiting on on you know these performative dollars from all of these other corporations that are still fully white owned and operated so I I think this that it, I think yes, this is the time to truly, you know, really talk about ownership and building our own and owning our own. And um, a lot of of what I, our company at Generation Titans is doing is thinking about how do we support entrepreneurs in the early stage um, so that they don't have to um, work on other people's terms, so that they can actually build for their communities um, and. I, about a year ago, I had an entrepreneur who was doing amazing work, was like, I am tired of having to change myself to fit the, you know, a profile of, of venture capital angel investor. Um, and so I think we have these barriers that make it hard to build our own, right? And, but you think about the resiliency and the history of our country, you think about Black Wall Street, you think about Durham and, you know, the Black Wall Street that was in Durham, North Carolina. I, I think that I, there is this opportunity to, while this movement is happening and while we're thinking about policy shifts, to also think about wealth building in our communities through entrepreneurship. I struggle with this one, to be honest. Um, I also, you know, generally come with the polarizing perspective. So, you know, if that's, if that's my role here, then let me, let me step into it. Speak your truth. Uh, I don't know, that's all I got, right? Um, there's this, so, so Brianna mentioned this reality of like, you know, how like there's been, you know, shifts in the music industry and how we interpret those things. And, and, and it's real, like it's a real part of what's happening right now. And I think for me, what really resonates uh, when I hear those things, I'm like, yeah, you know, like hip hop's always been really popular, right? Like people are just now becoming aware of it. Um, we operate as if new truths are just new truths, right? Like it's new information as opposed to new awareness of information that's always been there. Um, and, and, and I think like that is an easy pitfall that we fall into in doing this, where we like forget that like country music started with black people, right? Like folk music started with black people, right? Jazz, you know what I mean? Like we just think about the foundational roots of where these things came from. Um, and then, you know, we, we see how they get morphed. We think about like systemic oppression and how the society is structured. 
um, that gets morphed into taking away or attempting to dilute the, the impact and influence of people, reframing and shifting the narrative. And, and I think what's happening now um, is less like something new and more a reclamation of the narratives, right? Like people are like, I'm going to control this narrative at this point. Um, and that's really critical and important. So, you know, I, I think that's important. I think, you know, that's where my perspective on like building your own comes from because marginalized people have always built their own. They just always have. If you think about the United States post reconstruction, like the thing that happens now when we think about tropes that come with marginalized groups, you know, particularly if you think about like black Americans here, we say, um, well, I don't understand, like, you know, after they were free, right, like free by fake legal doctrine, um, after that happened, like, why didn't they build their own? And, and they did, right? <laughs> Very successfully. And they're documented uh, in history instances of thriving communities of people who are not allowed to exist and function within a within a country, within a society that they literally created. And in the absence of that ability or you know permission, they created their own, right? We think about Rosewood, we think about Tulsa, we think about Seneca Village, which literally was a community that existed in Central Park in New York City, right? People were just not allowed. You literally had like black people were just not allowed to live anywhere else in New York. Back when you're thinking like the movie Gangs of New York, right? Everybody lived below 14th Street. Right. And then it's like, if you are not like white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you are not allowed to be here. So then they like move up. So you have to think about like New York City. Now, when we think about it is very different than what it was at that period of time. Go back to like 1700s. And we're talking about like rural. Right. So there's like a rural community in what is now um, Central Park. Right. In New York City, where people literally like lived fishing out of the Hudson, which is crazy for us to think about now. Right. Like literally Hudson River. Like I'm going to go fishing. Um, and here's the interesting thing about that is that that community in particular, when the Irish potato famine happened in like 1845, you had a massive influx of refugees from Ireland who came over. Um, and there's a whole story around like why that famine affected that population because they were literally being exploited um, by Britain. But they come here and again are like relegated to the lowest class in society. They're not allowed to like live with other what we now know as like white people um, in New York City. They're like outcasted, they're demonized, um, you know, underemployed, no housing, like the, the same story. And a lot of them went and lived in Seneca Village, right? Like the population after the Irish potato famine, this entirely black community became like a third Irish, right? And that is like a narrative truth about what's happening. And at the same time, we don't tell it, right? So like we have to elevate that narrative to be like, this has always been happening. And realize that there is a history of white domestic terrorism in this country that destroys things that marginalized groups try to create and build, right? Seneca Village was chilling in Central Park. Then New York City decided that they wanted a park. So they hired some surveyors, the surveyors went and they looked all through New York City to find the perfect location for it. And where did they find? The Upper East Side. And if you know anything about the Upper East Side, then you can probably imagine the people in the Upper East Side did not like that. So what they did is they used political positioning and power, right, and systemic racism in order to determine the best possible location was in Central Park. So now they come in, they bulldoze Seneca Village, they kick everybody out, right? And literally like to this day, they're like, you know, um, parts of Central Park that like memorialize this like group of people that literally live there and were like kicked out of their homes. So I think the change has to be one of two things. Like one, the reclamation of the narrative, right? And like when we know that's a part of our narrative, then it doesn't feel weird to do it. Right, the, the concept of like black women being the, the largest growing group um, of entrepreneurs starting businesses, right? Like is unsurprising to me. There's been a long history of black women just like literally running the world. So I'm like, yeah, no, that's like, that's a, in alignment with what has happened over history, but it's just like new data point. So, you know, the more we reclaim that history, the more it's like not unusual. And when it becomes popularized then it happens more at scale. And when you have what happens more at scale then you have more people who are advocates and voices in service of that. And that's how change happens. And at the same time, that in isolation is not sufficiently radical enough. Because if you're arming and equipping and preparing people and empowering them in order to create their own only to have to function in a structure that is designed for their destruction, you are perpetuating oppression. It's the same reason why like, when people reach out to us and they're like, we're looking at hiring more brown people. I'm like, yeah, no. That doesn't, we wanna do implicit bias training. Yeah, no, like that doesn't work, right? Like you're talking about this reformist orientation to tweaking and adjusting things within a structure that is fundamentally flawed, right? And, and if we're thinking about the definition of the word radical, you're changing the fundamental nature of something, right? The way that it moves and the way that it operates. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to change it. 
Um, and, and so like, I think it's never, you know, the, the problem we run into in this work is it's always either or, and, and for me, it's like, it's actually both, right? Like we need those people who start those businesses and do that work and engage in that way. And we need to make the, sh we need to like work on the structures that limit the ability, if they haven't already, are going to limit the ability um, of them to flourish in dominant culture and society, right? So I, I just want to add the piece of, of reclaiming the narrative. Um, I was reading recently that after reconstruction, black land ownership was at a height and, and that number was 14 million acres for black land ownership. 94% of that was either stolen, destroyed, um, taken through violence. Mm -hmm. And we, that's not part of our narrative. And if, you know, I think we hear, we talk about Black Wall Street, we talk about Tulsa, but in probably every community in every state across this country, there is a story very similar. So I think reclaiming that narrative, um, working in the space of entrepreneurship, it is frustrating to hear the narrative of, oh, this one entrepreneur of color was the exception and they are now, you know, the poster child and they went through all this hardship and that's the, that's the story, right? And that is just, to me, reclaiming that narrative of this is not new. This is who, who we have been as people of being innovative, of being able to create, create out of nothing. And I think the second piece is, and I think, Ahmad, you hit on this, is you have to almost, it's how do you build in the system, but at the same time kind of work to destroy or reimagine the system. And I think, I think a lot about that when we're talking about capital, the current system doesn't work for getting capital to business owners. So how do we, at the same time, help people in that, but also think about new ways of doing that? How do we democratize that? Um, I, I found as I'm doing work, it is frustrating, whether it's in philanthropy, whether it's in fundraising, whether it's in corporate America, you have a, a small group that kind of is, are their decision makers. And they can say, you know, we're going to give, you know, a small 0.01% of our budget to this effort, whether that's, you know, a company saying, oh, we gave half a million dollars when their revenue is close to a billion dollars. Or it can be a funder saying, oh, you know, we have, you know, we're going to give 1% of, of our, our venture funds to black people. And it's like, that has to shift because, or either we just have to, 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 I think, versus having the reformist mindset say, what are other ways? How do we pull our capital in our communities and think about wealth building that way versus trying to beg for crumbs that when we know that's not true transfer of wealth. And to that end, do do we feel like I guess that and I think that's a very interesting point, especially in the in the in terms of how do we rebreak and reimagine the system, right? And and I think what we're watching right now, even in this moment in the past couple of weeks, is a lot of people mobilizing a vote, right? And and you know, I'm not afraid to say that 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 really kind of pings on the cynic in me where I kind of shrug at that. I feel like there's a lot more we could be doing. Um, but I'm curious whether whether it be local or national, what do, do we feel like there is a role that our vote in government has to play here? Do we feel like there's something that, that, that is that element of rebuilding and reforming the system that can be harnessed from the vote? Or do we feel like that is, that is some sort of hollow gesture using people of color and black people in particular as political pawns? I'm, I'm, I'm a super cynic on this. I, I will actually answer the question after you know, I hear from these uh, amazing co-panelists, but I will say that I live and grew up in Washington, D.C., so like even the concept of us voting and doing anything is dead. Like D.C. license plates say no taxation with no representation. Like we don't have voting representation in, in, in Congress at all, right? Like it's like a thing in D.C., which is why they always fight for statehood. So like that's going to frame my cynic thing. I'm going to pause though. What do y'all think? So I think it's twofold, right? I think, you know, a portion of it is voting, right? But I think it's deeper than that in this country it's literally a mindset shift, right? It's not just about the black vote, it's about all of the votes. It's about what are we voting for? Why are they just talking about, like this is literally a, a, a humanity issue. It's deeper than just voting. It's literally everyone in the country and in the world needs to change their mindset. It's not just about giving black people what they want, right? It's about giving humans what is owed to us as humans. It's deeper than just voting for it. It's 
it's a mindset shift that needs to change. I think what we've learned also recently, which is crazy, is that everything that we know and love, even down to like children's songs, are all affected by racism and all influenced by racism. Like literally, like even us as young Black people, we didn't know that. These songs that we're singing as kids are built on, built off of racist tunes. Like we didn't know that, right? So it's just a mindset shift of the world that needs to happen, whether it's all at once or slowly, but it needs to happen ASAP. So that's my thought. Yeah, I think we spent a lot of time talking about voting at, you know, a national level. And I think about just at our community level. So you have more than 80% of DAs that are elected officials. And we talk about DAs being held accountable and attorney generals, that's where I feel like the power of, of a vote counts, right? Because that is in your local community. When we're talking about what's happening with policing and who sets charges and who determines um, if it goes to a grand jury, that is at the DA level, at the attorney general level. So I think I find it frustrating. We spend so much time talking about, you know, a, the presidential races and we don't have any research we're not being we're not getting the right information about what's happening at a community level and i think when you then talk about the community level you can shift to more radical things of defunding policing being able to have that power when you have elected officials who are who will answer your call or you can talk about participatory budgeting and being able to talk about the funding in a community so i think the local level is really to me where they're where i feel less cynical um yeah, I would say that I think I agree with you on that. And I feel like the issue comes down to how everything is marketed, right? Because in the end, the presidential election is what gets all the commercials, it's what gets all the pins, it's what, you know, the celebrities talk about, it becomes a thing. So people don't know that, you know, on the community level is where all the changes actually happen, right? So I think it's about letting not only it's about making those community elections a little bit more glossy the way that the presidential election is, right? Um, uh, making those talking points the way that we talk about Trump and Biden. It's not, it's not just about those people because there's so much that happens before we get to them. So it's, it's, we really do have to work. I think what America is good at is campaigns right but only the the ones that they want us to focus on but there are so many other things that are happening while we're focused on this one big thing right there's so many smaller things that make up the big picture so we as a people need to do and also as a country need to do a better job at focusing on those smaller things and not ignoring those because we're focused on that big shiny thing over there yeah um i'm like a, a i know it probably doesn't seem that way i'm generally like a pretty practical person right um it, but then also, if we like look at history, we have set up a country that can make that approach through the political process as it currently stands a forever uphill battle, right? Um, and at the same time, it's often not either or, it's in, right? Elections are going to happen whether people vote or not. Like they're going to take place. It is like written in. Um, and because they're going to happen, it's important to make sure that there's representation and involvement, right? Um, for two reasons. One, if it doesn't change anything, it also doesn't cost us anything to do that, right? Um, and at the same time, like, you provide opportunities uh, to potentially affect change in that way. Again, there's like a lot of barriers that exist. Um, and at the same time, we have to understand that like that avenue is not designed for success to be an outcome of that strategy. Um, if it was, then the electoral college system, you know, wouldn't be what it is now. Uh, in the way that we have a difference between electoral vote and popular vote, right? Like you can lose a popular vote and still win the election. Um, the concept of a two party system in this country, the fact that you literally just have to choose between, you know, like easily the lesser of two evils, right? You easily fall into that position because it's like one of these two candidates is going to win. Um, so that would fundamentally have to shift. Constitutional amendments for like the 13th Amendment in the way that, you know, we've set up the, 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 the carceral system in this country and fuel the prison industrial complex, right? Um, where we have literally like 13th Amendment, like abolished slavery with the exception of people who are incarcerated. And we have to realize that we've used that system in order to perpetuate um, things that we've gotten rid of. So, I mean, literally like when we abolish slavery, right? At least in law, 
um, what we started using is we started creating new laws um, and, and utilizing police forces in a way in order to control populations of previously enslaved people who are now free. Right. And then after it was like black people who were previously enslaved who are now free, it started becoming people who were immigrating to the country. Right. And then they were used against Irish people. Right? Like that's how we militarized um, law enforcement in that manner in order to kind of perpetuate this idea. And then, you know, once you're in that system, it's like, oh, great. Like you've been incarcerated. Guess what? Instead of keeping you in a prison, we are going to lease you out to companies for labor. And that it, like did a lot of mining in this country, did a lot of railroad building in this country, right? The whole concept of like people pickaxing or whatever, that, like, that's where that came from. You literally would be a ward of the state and then like relegated to labor to work for the profit of a company if you were incarcerated um, based on laws that were literally fabricated for the purpose of your incarceration. We still do that now. We just hide it a lot more in the privatization of prisons and how that's kind of taking place. So you have this like entire industry that is not privatized, which functions as a massive like voter suppression tactic right, in the United States of America. Ex-convict, can't vote, right? You do that, I mean, it, or you could go back and think about, you know, like after 2008, there were something like 30 different states that passed specific voter suppression legislation. And like 16 of them actually like adopted it and moved it. And that was like in 2011. And since we keep seeing this process, and now, you know, we got the rope dope with coronavirus, COVID-19, you know, justifying more voter suppression. I live in Washington, DC, our vote only like barely counts. Local elections are, are more important. When I had to vote here, like, I don't know, it was like two or three weeks ago, um, I live east of the river, which is like a predominantly uh, black community, right? So like we are 80 some percent black, like east of the river in Washington, DC. And what we end up finding is that in Ward 7 and 8, predominant black population, high rates of, um, you know, lack of services, uh, poverty, like all of those things, the 21 voting precincts that are normally open were dropped down to three for 80,000 people. So literally like I went to vote and with all the privileges that I have, I'm like in line for five hours in order to like vote in DC, right? Now I can do that, right? I can be there for five hours. Like, oh, sorry, I can't take this call y'all. Hey, it won't be canceling, moving around, right? Like the privileges that are afforded to me allows me to still navigate that process and vote. But you know, and what I saw is there's a lot of people around me who still did that, did the same thing as I did. They stood right there. Um, even if they didn't have those same privileges afforded to them, but some people just can't do that, right? Um, so, so we have, this kind of two-headed beast that's taking place where, you know, we can have faith in like the American system and voting and all those things and like participate in them while also acknowledging that like that pathway by itself is only ever going to serve the purpose by which it was, for, for which it was created. Um, and, and if it wasn't created for the greater good, and I also like want to note this, we act like that system is like, oh, it was just literally like created solely for the, you know, for the purposes of, of, of supporting like whiteness and white supremacy in this country, which is like partly true, um, but it's actually less about like people of color and white people and more about um, wealth and lack of wealth, right? It's about the, the power of the 1%. Because um, we got to realize in this country, rich land owning Europeans who later were considered white people did not care about poor white people at all. It is evident in policy. It is evident in like multiple instances in history. Like while, while there was an active process to stop freed black people in this country from reading, right? There was literally no effort in order to like promote broader education. Literally you just had like communities of black people who started educating themselves, right? Like we got one person that can read, we're gonna teach everybody. States literally made it illegal in order to suppress that and simultaneously um, cared not at all about like whether or not education was afforded to poor white people, right? Like we didn't have um, mandatory education in this country across all 50 states until 1918. Like public education, like that wasn't a thing that was mandatory. And even then it was just elementary school, right? Like, um, so, so I mean, we have this, this flawed idea that like, you know, playing the game through the established means in the system as it currently exists is gonna get us to our, de our destination. But I'm like, we just have to be radical and rethinking everything, right? Like we're talking about shifting the, the structure of this country, like the fundamental nature of how everything came to exist is the thing that, uh, or the fence that we have to rattle. I think that's I, that really actually is, is something I think about a lot and it helps actually me dovetail into uh, a question from from one of the viewers, uh, Divya, and I'm going to I'm going to kind of spin the question a little bit in a way that I think is more fitting for this conversation. But how do we this this current this current climate, you know, and I think for us, it's always important to us, but a current climate where racial justice is severely important to it seems like the world at large, for whatever reason, performative or otherwise, how do we take that and, and use that in order to, to push forward this notion of post-capitalism, right? Because we know that, that a lot of this racism is rooted in, in the economics of it all, 
So how do we push forward in, into a post-capitalist world using the leverage of, of racial justice and, and this equality that we're looking for? Yeah, I'm throwing curveballs late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I don't know if this is answering uh, this question completely, but I do think there's some steps that all of us can start doing when we're looking at how we're spending our dollar, but also looking at if you have a 401k, are they funding police unions? Are they funding prison related labor? Are like just looking, asking those questions, right? There's templates online. You can email to ask, you know, how are my dollars funding this systematic racism and, 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 and asking that and then saying, you know, and putting the pressure and being willing to risk something. And I think that is, in companies, right? If you're in a company asking, okay, you made a statement, what are you actually doing? What are you doing in terms of leadership? What are you doing in terms of paying a living wage? Like, I think being willing to put pressure, even if that means risking something, um, is what's going to continue to have to happen. And I think things like living wage, things like actually looking, what are we funding with our dollars? Um, and that takes more work than just doing something on Instagram. It's hard. It, and it, it, it takes research. Yeah, I think to Jessica's point, it's definitely about our spending dollars, right? Because whether it's coming from a genuine place or just because they don't want to look bad as a company, as long as the results are there, I think we are going in a good direction, right? So we have to know that the reason why all of this is happening right now also is because it's no longer hidden the fact that we are influence, we're influential as a people right in terms of where people want to spend their money we have comp companies kind of get the credibility of looking cool and being effective based on us right as a people so if we are all talking about it right whether we are a minority in the country you know percentage wise or not we have we have a lot of influence on the actual productivity and success of a company Right. And we need to we need to see that and we need to use that to our advantage, because if, quote unquote, they get canceled, there's no coming back from that. Right. And nobody wants to get canceled in this day and age. So we can have that power and we can control that using our spending dollar and our dollar is very important, is very powerful. We should use that and we can affect change, whether it's genuine or not. Yeah, there's a I mean, you know, capitalism is the devil. If we're just looking at history, if we're being real with it. Um, but I think what, you know, the way that we need to approach it is really thinking about like what models of, of activism and revolution like have existed in these movements and how that can apply also to like literally when you want to break anything down. Um, and also knowing like the language of value that exists in those spaces. So I'm gonna give you like a little tidbit. I always think it through like stories, right? So I was a, I was a, I was a school principal in Brooklyn, New York, right? Um, I know, crazy. Uh, and I had this thing. I was like, yo, my staff works really hard. We do really difficult work. We used to just like have social functions as a staff, right? Like happy hour this, bowling hour, like, like every two weeks, we were just like, we're going places. Um, and, you know, I was like spending money on, like, I was just like finding opportunities to like spend money on them, like just for them, right? And, you know, I was like called into a meeting by the quote unquote powers of be. Um, and they're like, we need to talk about this line item. Um, I'm like, yeah, tell me more about it. And they're like, well, you know, you spent, you know, five times more than any other school in the network, like for this thing in particular. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, what you mean is that my line item, right, my, in my budget is five times more than any other school. Like I'm not overspending, I'm spending what I plan to spend, but I plan to spend more than everybody else, right? Um, so they're like pushing me on this, like, is this a good use of resources, da, da, da. So I tried to like appeal to like the you know, like educators work hard and blah, 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 and like, you know what I mean? We need to take care of our people. Like I'm doing that. Um, and they didn't want to hear it. They're just like, oh, whatever. Like you're spending too much money. It's not worth it. Right. Um, my appeal to like the altruistic reality, right? Like the empathy, the like understand, put ourselves in our shoes, take care of people like that. Doing that um, was ineffective. So I was like banging my head against the wall. And I was like, I know I'm not going to change what I'm doing, but like, I got to speak this other language. I mean, the language that they speak, like, doesn't add up to me because I mean, it's a school and it's about people, but at the end of the, way, end of the day, like, it's also a business. Um, so I went back and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to keep the budget the same. And then my justification shifted. And what I said is studies have shown 
that the amount of money that it costs to replace a teacher, a classroom teacher, is estimated, and like here's the data, to be approximately three to $4,000, right, per person. Um, and the cost of money, right, like what it costs to replace like a mid-level leader, right? You're talking about like an instructional leader or a cultural leader, something like that, right? Um, a system principal, someone that manages curriculum, uh, operations director, uh, is approximately like five to seven thousand dollars for like per person, um, and the cost to replace a school leader, meaning like a school principal, and, and this is in the context of like New York City, is somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars like per person. Um, so, when you look at my retention numbers about how people like working here, the number of people I get to stay saves me way more money than the amount of money I'm spending on whatever it is that's getting me to get them to stay, right? And like that dollars and cents conversation around like, cap all right, cool, like this is your capitalistic game that's silly and disconnected or whatever. Let's just flip it and use it as leverage in this context and, and have this conversation through the lens of dollars and cents. Um, and the reason why I say it's important to look back at history is because the reason why I came to that orientation was because we tell, us, tell ourselves this thing, um, which is to say that like, you know, you're just talking about the concept of race. Racism exists because you have racist people. Racist people created racist policies. Racist policies resulted in racial disparities, right? Makes sense, right? Like, so if that's the continuum, if we're talking about like racist people, racist policies, right? Racial disparities. If I wanna like stop the racial disparities, I gotta go all the way to the beginning of the process and work on the racist people, right? That's the highest leverage thing to do. That doesn't work for the same reason that like implicit bias training doesn't work. It doesn't inform action, it doesn't shift action, it doesn't do any of those things. Um, that's because like that continuum is ahistorical. It doesn't represent how history actually worked. The way history actually worked is that foundationally you had people with wealth and power, right? Rich landowning Europeans who came here, who created racist policies first in service of maintaining their wealth and power. They did not care who people were. It wasn't like, you were, like the concept of white wasn't on the books anywhere until 1691. Like that wasn't a reason, right? They're literally like documented incidences. If you think about Nathaniel Bacon and Bacon's revolution, right? Where literally William Berkeley was the governor of Jamestown at that time, got this like person, Nathaniel Bacon, who's like, I need you to come help me. I'm on the frontier outside of Jamestown. I'm fighting with the Native Americans. Like we can't stand for this. Come on, white man, let's, let's, let's bound together and like fight them. Um, and the governor was like, I actually make a lot of money off of them. So like, no, nah, I'm good. Like, you got it, it's, it's your own business, homie, figure it out. And Nathaniel Bacon got so upset, that he goes out, he literally like frees all his laborers, right? White, European, whatever, talks to all his neighbors, he's like, y'all having this problem? Great, we're gonna free our people, right? Again, European and African indentured servants who were there, obligated to labor, lived and worked in the same conditions. And he created a militia. And logic would say he would take that militia and he would like, fight the Native Americans, secure their land. But no, what he did is he marched into Jamestown and he burned it to the ground. And the wealthy landowning Europeans fled on boats. They called in the British, the British came in, they quelled the rebellion, whatever. But like that, that moment in history showed two things. One, interests associated with wealth and power always trump the like racial dynamics or whatever that like we think are the things that, that determine it now. Um, and two, the scariest thing to that power is the people who are collectively losing, realizing they have more in common with each other than with the people who actually have the power in that instance. So policies are foundational. And then policies resulted in disparities. And those disparities required a need to have ideas to justify them. So we see the ideas on the tail end being created on the fly to justify the policies that existed. Right? So it's like, we have this policy that says that, you know, uh, well, actually, no, you can't be free because like, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're, 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 you're black, right? You can't be free in this situation. That's like our policy. We see disparities in treatment and the ideas behind it, you know, you get eugenics and like, you're inferior, we're doing you a favor, like, right? Like, we're saving you, your soul. We're gonna use like leverage religion in order to like perpetuate this. The ideologies are on the tail end. If we understand that that's how history works, then the approach that we take is always foundational in the policies of how things are structured. That is the fundamental nature of how our institutions operate and run on a daily basis. And the radical change comes in literally shifting the policy and how it works. So if you're talking about capitalistic systems, what you're really talking about is 
how do they get their money and how do they use it, right? Who is in that position of authority and power? How do they operate, right? Like the fundamental nature of how those things are structured is like a roadmap that can exist in social justice, um, that it comes from social justice movements that can inform how we tackle things such as capitalistic structures. So that's why, I, you know, I'm never against the like work within the institution or whatever. I think like that's important as well. But, you know, if I'm referencing a book called The Spook Who Sat By The Door, you got to infiltrate that institution and also know that like, foundation you like a double agent you're like i'm trying to figure out how this thing works right like if, if you're trying to demolish a building they don't demolish a building from the outside at all and we think about systemic oppression as like a massive skyscraper like when they're bringing that thing down they're not like running a tank into it or hitting it with stuff from the outside no matter how much you do from the outside it's only going to damage the facade of it they'll replace it it'll be fine but if you understand how that system is structured and how it operates and where the load points and what is you know uh, weight bearing and all of those things you can use a lot less force a lot more strategically in order to dismantle something and reconstruct it. And people who get freaked out by dismantle, I'm always like, listen, I need you to understand that even if you have a house, if there's something flawed or faulty in it, there comes a point where it's more cost effective and more efficient and more strategic in order to bring it down and to put it back together than it is to try to fix it. It's the same reason why insurance companies total cars. They're like, mm, yeah, well, let's just scrap it, give you some money for it. Like that's cheaper than actually fixing it. Um, so, I mean, I think like those models exist in other places. We just oftentimes uh, don't do enough work around understanding the history of them to be like, oh, well, like, this is the same thing. Like, let's just apply this here. And that that's a good natural end. We're at, we're at the end of the road. <laughs> I, would, I mean, I would love to go for another hour if we could. Um, thank you so much, Jessica, Brianna, Ahmed. Um, I mean, I'm going I'm to borrow some from Ahmed here. If you really care, you're gonna go find out about these people. You're gonna go find out about what they're doing in Generation Titans, at, you know, at Platoon, at Overcoming Racism. Just go do the work, it's on y'all. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks. Thanks.